so my name is Shad Frazier. I'm the VP of Operations for Endeavor Energy. Unlike our previous guests, I am not a UT grad. Uh, I graduated from Texas Tech with a petroleum engineering degree, have graduated from OU with an MBA, so kind of different route and represent the other side of the fence. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, though, is not my company, but really talking about energy itself. As an oil and gas producer, my company represents 2% of the United States energy production. So we've come a long way in six years, but really what's going to happen in the next couple of 10 years to 25 years is going to be more important. So let's talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to break it down into our current energy landscape, following that up by what our future energy demands are going to be as a country and as a state, and then really looking at the cost benefit of the different types of power generation facilities that are available to us. You know, we're going to come from where we are today to where we're going in the future, where we've talked about already. On the nuclear side, on the natural gas side, there's lots of options, but we have to get there in the right way as quick as possible. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to talk about the real question at the end about why power is important for everyone. So when we look at the first, this graph that you see on the upper right, so if we can see here, this is a chart of Texas power demand based upon the last six years. The one thing when you start looking at that, it lo looks like a lot of bit of, lots of stacks of bubbles as it goes up. But one of the big issues there is we've gone from a state that was using about four to five gigawatts of power in the summer to a point that we are now getting close to nine gigawatts of power demand in summertime. You know, we are getting more and more demand on our power grid as we've already talked about. This growth that we're seeing is happening across the state. So how do we supply that? Well, the problem is we supply it in a multifaceted function. So the graph on the bottom left talks about the fact that our power grid is made up of three forces. We have base load, we end up having the renewable load, and then we have the peak demand load, the spiker or peaker mode that we were talking about. So we have base load. Base load is our coal plants, the nuclear plants, the hydro plants. They give us a base level of power that runs all the time and it runs 24 seven and it's out there. So that's where we kind of start from. And right now in the spring months and in the fall months, the base load is almost enough to meet our full demand. So we can get by with about 40% of what we need. The problem is, is that Texas doesn't live in a one climate system. We work in a multi-climate system that can either be very cold in the winter time or very hot in the summertime. We get into the summer months and we're at four o'clock, six o'clock in the afternoon. And as many of us realized last year, when it was 115 degrees outside, all of us were running our AC, all of us were running refrigeration units. You know, the scary part in the state of Texas is the average you know, Texan has two refrigerators in their home. All of that takes power. So that power demand is what we have to build. So that's where the renewables come in, where windmills come in, where we start having solar panels. They're allowing us to bring on power during the day. But the problem is we can't guarantee that power works. So then that's where natural gas comes in. Natural gas is our pipeline spec and we open and close that gate as we need to bring on the additional power demand. So when we talk about our total demand spec, when we use on an average day, we're using on average about 80 gigawatts and we have a total capacity with all of the different forces of 156. So we have a lot of room inside of this grid to bring power on and off. But the problem is, is we have to manage that because, you know, it's not just a light switch. It doesn't just turn on and off. So as we go through in, inside the state of Texas, as we we're talking about the base load is the nuclear, the hydro, the coal. From that, we get about 20 of our gigawatts. The dynamic is our wind, our solar power storage that we've been talking about. That's about 58, but that 58 is variable. It moves around depending upon what's going on. And then there's about 70 gigawatts of natural gas power that we can turn it on and off based upon a pipeline and we open and close the valves. So this is how the state of Texas is providing the power today that gives everyone the ability that we see to turn a light switch on or off. Now, one of the big things that comes up for everyone is we have all these different power forces and all these different power forces all go out and they go to the government and say, we need subsidies to be able to make this to happen. In the last legislation, legislative session, the Texas governors and the Texas House and Senate passed new legislation allowing for more natural gas generation to be built with subsidies from the state because they saw that we needed more peak demand in the short term of natural gas supply. 
We as a state export natural gas all over the world. We have more supply of it than we need. But we didn't have enough power two, summers, or two winters ago when the winter storms hit because we didn't have enough natural gas moving through the system. So how can we put more natural gas power generation where it's needed to be? So these numbers are up here. I'm not going to read them to you, but the one thing that you kind of see in there is that we talk about it on a dollar per megawatt basis. The subsidies that are out there for solar and wind are pretty heavy, but they need it. This is a brand new technology. No new technology ever gets built without having some type of support to support it in its fledgling cycles. You know, it's no different than a teenager. You don't just throw a teenager out to the wind in a job, you know, with no job. You kind of have to help support them, pay their insurance, pay their fuel as they start working at Dairy Queen, and then they're making their $15 an hour at Dairy Queen. Well, then they get a real job, they go off, and they start making $20, $30. Now they don't need the insurance, they don't need the fuel, they can start paying it for themselves. That's what we're seeing here today, is that we are subsidizing like we subsidize a teenager until they become fully functional, fully capable of supporting themselves. The natural, the oil industry supports itself mostly these days, but there's still exploration that happens. That exploration is where you start seeing the sub subsidies for oil and gas. That's where we're going out and drilling in places where there's no energy today. So, you know, when we started in the Eagleford, subsidies were paid for the exploration of the Eagleford that happens south of here. The Permian Basin, we've been drilling for years. You know, since the 40s and 30s, we've been drilling out there. That's not exploration. But when the Barnett was drilled up north of Dallas, that was exploration 30 years ago. So those subsidies go into those plays. And we're still doing it today because we're constantly finding new places, new areas to find more energy. So this is when these slides start getting interesting. When we were talking a few minutes ago, talking about we have this much power today, but we need way more power. Well, the way more power is the, the world today uses about 100, barrel, 100 million barrels of oil a day. That is current world consumption. To get the rest of the world to live like the United States, to have the same power requirements, same power demand, the world needs 400 million barrels of oil a day. There is not that much oil to be found. We cannot go and drill for 400 million barrels of oil. There is no possible way. The money is not there. The people are not there. And the resource is not available. So we have to find these small modular reactors. We have to find other ways. We have to use solar. We have to use wind because we have to make up this difference. You know, we've seen several different people talk about it, but there are 3 billion people in the world today not connected to a power grid of any form or fashion. These are people that do not understand a light switch, that do not have a vehicle, that do not have a refrigerator, that live every day by the basis of a campfire. How do we get those people up to the lifestyle that we live? You know, the thing that always throws me is you think about how many Einsteins, how many of the great thinkers that we've had in the world today, the great scientists, how many Elon Musk, how many other people are out there that never got a chance to be who they could be because they lived their life every day gathering water and gathering wood. And that's all they did and never got a chance. That's what power allows. So we get to power density. Power density, this is a, you know, these slides will hopefully be available online afterwards. This is a really in-depth slide. But what we really talk about here is how much space do we use up to be able to make the power we need. The best place, as we already talked about, if we can make a small modular reactor that fits on the back of an 18-wheeler that can be moved around and generate 250 megawatts, that is the best possible space density that we can find. The next best thing that's out there is the bigger reactors on the nuclear side. Then you start getting into the oil and gas space. Why? Because we can actually use pretty small amounts of space, and most of the places where we find oil and natural gas are not in areas of localized environments. You know, I joke about it, the fact that I actually live in Midland, so I live in the largest industrial complex in the world. Because everywhere you go in Midland, there is nothing but another oil well. I drill oil and wells underneath the city of Midland every day. We live in a huge industrial plant. But the amount of energy we produce out of that is greater than the space that we use up. And that land has very low use outside of what we do for it. My family knows we tried to grow cotton on it for hundreds of years. And we made more money in 10 years of producing energy than we ever made producing cotton. 
So how we use the space matters. We've seen pictures of solar farms. We've seen pictures of solar panels. Those are very low or large space for the amount of power they create. So that means they have to take up physical space somewhere. The problem is, how many of you want a solar farm in your backyard? You know, the best example of that is when you sit there and you watch the reels that come across your, you know, your screen and you see the, there's a one that is Tim Dutton from Yellowstone. And he's up there talking about, in Wyoming, talking about, we're going to put solar farms across Wyoming. And it's like, well, you know, when you put a solar farm in, what happens to the sage grouse? Well, nothing happens to the sage grouse. He's there. Well, wait a second. Didn't you just get rid of the sage grouse's plant that he was living in so that he could produce? That's where he lived. You had to remove that to put your solar farm in, didn't you? Well, then the environmentalist kind of freezes up. All of these things take space and take land. They remove the environment to be able to make the power we need. So how do we balance those things out to where we use the space we need effectively and we don't hurt the people around it? So when we've been talking about the costs, we've heard today from the local power grid, we've heard from the larger power grid in San Antonio. The scary part about the power grid itself is that our average cost of power has gone from about eight cents a kilowatt hour to the average US is at 14.8 cents per kilowatt hour over the last 20 years. Our power costs have gone up to the point now that the average U.S. citizen is having to spend $1,600 a year on base power. This is just the power to heat a home, to heat a, put a refrigerator in, and cool a home in the summer. It's becoming a larger and larger percentage of everyone's average daily expense. So how do we manage these costs? You know, inflation is everywhere. It affects everything that's out there. But one item that has the lowest inflationary impact today, we've already talked about it, natural gas is selling at $1.80 at MCF today. So natural gas is actually the cheapest form of energy that is being produced anywhere in the world right now. And the United States has more gas than anywhere else in the world. The problem is we can't get it where it needs to be. You know, so two examples of this. At the very bottom, Diablo Canyon is a nuclear power plant that's in California. Diablo Canyon was a power plant, one of the big ones, not talking the small modular, old Gen 1 power plant. It was scheduled to be decommissioned. The decommissioning of this power plant was going to leave a large part of Northern California without enough power to support its own grid. They, that part of California actually imports a large part of their power from Oregon, Idaho, and Arizona. So everything got to up to about two to three months before they were going to shut the grid in and shut the plant off. And then they looked at the power grid and did the power studies and realized they couldn't do it. They didn't have enough support. The opposite end of that spectrum is New York City. So Indian Point is the same thing. Indian Point was one of the oldest and largest nuclear reactors that was in the United States. It powered up one third of New York City. They shut Indian Point down. What they did is they brought three natural gas power plants on to replace one nuclear reactor. The problem is the natural gas that comes to that plant had to have a pipeline. And a lot of those pipelines weren't in place. So we had issues and we still have issues. If you go to Boston in the wintertime right now, Boston is importing natural gas from Trinidad and Tobago so that they can warm Boston because we cannot move natural gas from Houston harbors into Boston because of our laws and rules. We have to be smarter, work with our legislators, and work on how do we get better at managing our power. There we go. So we'll move into the last piece, future energy forecasts. When you look at the future energy of where we are as a society and what we're doing, transportation Residential, commercial, all of these sectors have a very kind of minor forecast of being relative small growth, but the biggest part of industrial uh, growth in the U.S. is going to be the industrial growth cycle. What does that mean? That's the Elon Musk of the world. That's the industrial cycle that's building new nuclear plants. The places that are finding new ways to build more and new technology, that's Apple, that's the new data centers, that's the Bitcoin miners, all these people that are out there, they're chewing up the biggest part of our energy that we need. So how do we balance that 
against everything else we need. Society has a base load of human consumption need and hum human need to survive, but we have to be able to provide all of the power to go out there. This slide I'll let you read on your own. These are just kind of facts and figures. This is really about how society uses power today. And I put this out there because we we're actually teaching teachers how to use power. And that has its own case load. There are lots of facts and figures. Students want to know about this stuff. But one of the things in the state of Texas, for any of you that don't know, I love this fact that there are 500,000 miles of pipelines in use today in the state of Texas that no one knows about. There are 50,000 miles of power transmission lines in use every day. We move power better in the state of Texas than anywhere else in the Union. You know, United States, we move power where it needs to be. And we have the greatest capability of doing that. But the bottom one is the thing that's changing. In Texas, there are 2,463 charging stations to support 52,190 EVs on the road. And these are you know, year old stats, but those stats are changing every day versus there are 7 million point, 7.8 million vehicles on the road of which there are 10,904 gasoline fueling stations. How do we make the transition as a society that if, we, if EVs are the way to go, how are people gonna get comfortable when they can fill up their car in 10 minutes or less, or they have to fill up their car every 100 miles and it takes 45 minutes at an EV charging station that's full, and they have to wait. Is this really the way we want to go? Is there a balance? And I'd give you, I don't have it up here, the Toyota rule is out there. Toyota has a phrase, and the reason why if you go to a Toyota dealership, you don't see an electric vehicle anywhere on their lot. They have the 1, 60, and 30 rule. For every one EV that you produce, all the metals, materials, and everything put into that one EV can make six plug-in hybrids or make 30 regular plug-in Priuses that can be generated. So is the electric vehicle the best use of the materials? Because there is not enough nickel, there is not enough cobalt, there is not enough heavy metals to make EVs for everyone in the United States. We have to have a balance in our approach. So the real question as it comes down to is that every utopian society that's ever been written about, ever been discussed, you know, my greatest story is always Star Trek. In the world of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry already wrote it up, described that the world changed in the day that they figured out they could make power out of the dilithium crystal, which, you know, the dilithium crystal is an unknown. But it's basically they figured out how they can make harmonics turn power out for everyone. And as soon as power was free, then there was no capitalism needed because power was available for everybody. In today's society, that is the limiting factor, as we've already discussed. There's not enough water. There's not enough power. And we have to find a way to get all of society raised. So how do we do that? You know, electricity is great. Wind power, solar power, all those things are great. The modular is the next big step. We start making modular power, all of a sudden, that is the big step. 15 years from now, fusion, if it becomes full functioning and we actually get more power, well, I'm the, I know, see the head shaking. If we actually ever get fusion to work where we can get more out of it than we put into it, that's gonna be another big step change for us. But we need, as a society, four times as much power as we generate today to be able to survive. So, and at the end of the day, we can't replace a large part of our society with an EV. You can't replace our jets. Air transportation can't be replaced by a battery. You can't replace cargo ships that move all of our goods and services all across the world. All of that has to require diesel today. There's plans, and it's pretty scary. We're talking about moving our cargo ships back to using winds and sails because we want to get rid of diesel. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't make a super tanker carrying a big, you know, a full load of vehicles across the United States on wind sails. It's going to be a really slow boat to China when we do that. So the world is going to have to change, and with it, how we work as a society. But at the end of the day, if we do not have power, you know, we had a scary thought the other day when at t went out for everybody. How scared did everyone start getting real something was going to happen? 
The real thing should scare you is that if the United States lost power, it takes less than nine months for the entire, for 90% of the U.S. population to die. That's how much we are relying on power. If you cannot refrigerate, you cannot transport, society falls apart. And the biggest item in that, that most people don't think about, is water. Most society falls apart in seven days without water. Totally disintegrates. And if you do not have electricity, we cannot move water. We have to have this electricity. So it has to be a balanced source. It has to be reliable. Both Kerrville and CPS both said that one of the top things is they have to be able to, everyone has to trust that when they turn that light switch, the power will come on. So as a society, the bottom line here is power cannot be in any one item. It can't be, it has to be solar. It has to be wind. It has to be, so, it has to be all. Because the world needs more power than we can produce. And the sooner we get to that point and the sooner we realize that the more power we produce, the better society as a whole will be. Thank you for your time tonight.